like everything else, like the game isn't trying to say like, oh, colonizing this new planet is what we're supposed to do, or it's it's not even like um, this is the goal of the game. Maybe humans are supposed to die eventually. Mm-hmm. Like maybe we should never have left the earth. Like even though we had these these big aspirations um, and desire to do things differently, like it doesn't mean that we're owed that. Um, and maybe there's no escaping from the from the situation that we created for ourselves on our home planet. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy. Let's start this episode as we always do with our Patreon shout outs. This is our special thank you to everyone who subscribed at our Patreon name in the credits tier for the month of April. So that's a very big thank you to Genevieve, Lindsay, Jackie, Ben, Pimatai, Adiyanka, Seethy Mess, Ava, and Sammy. Thank you all so much for your support. Love Thanks that. for bringing the April showers. <laughs> <laughs> well, the April showers bring the May flowers, right? Yeah. So they're showering us with support, Aww. which will enable us to flower. <laughs> oh, that's so nice of you all. Uh, remember, if you want to get your name in the credits, you can hop on over to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod, where you can subscribe for as little as just two dollars a month and get access to our monthly bonus series called co-op mode. In our April bonus episode, Spencer gave their review of the Steam Deck. I talked about my time playing Yakuza Zero, and then we both geeked out over our unknown shared love of Fruits Basket. So range. If that sounds like uh, some stuff that's of interest to you and you want to hear us talk about that, uh, or if you're just looking for a little more pixel therapy in your life come check out the patreon and uh, get access to literally years worth of content to catch up on now and of course if you're a fan of what we do here on pixel therapy and i suspect that you are if you're listening right now (laughs) please consider sharing us with your friends and family rating and reviewing us on apple podcasts or even writing into the show by emailing us at pixel therapy pod at gmail.com because we would really truly love to hear from you All right, Spencer, it's time to get cozy. It's time to pull up an armchair. Feel free to lie down on the couch. Let's talk about our feelings. How are you? How am I? (laughs) Well, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy 3 Fuck yeah, you did. Oh my gosh, that movie went places. It it really did. Like, oh, I mean... I really think, in retrospect, like, I think Guardians of the Galaxy is my favorite Marvel trilogy. Yeah. Um, It just is really giving on all levels. Like, all the characters are awesome. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to love about everyone. Um, They really... I I just love how grounded it is in its themes, and it never really... The stakes never really get too high. Like, you don't feel like, oh my god, what is this, like, crazy plot? This, like way too big bloated thing that I've gotten involved in. Like, I just feel like it always brings it back to the little family they Mm -hmm. formed and it's the music is there. The acting is there. The writing is hilarious. Um, so I, I don't really, I I sort of consider myself a coerced Marvel fan. Like everyone (laughs) around me loves it and the people I love, love it. So I, I just tag along for the ride. You've been dragged um, kicking and screaming. And I've somehow seen like every single thing. <laughs> somehow it's just been somehow. placed in front of your eyeballs. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this, but I just know things that can't get I away never from wanted it. to know. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I love this series. Uh, I know you saw it too. Yeah. Um, so I'm, yeah, I, 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 now we're doing a <laughs> mini film review, but uh, I just think, you know, if, if, if you watch the first two movies, I think it's definitely worth a watch. Yeah. Um, I think um, one of the things I am not so sure about is I feel like this movie in particular, the like the violence, the gratuitous mm. violence level is definitely up. Yeah. And I don't know if that's just a thing of like, people are getting bored with the Marvel movies. We need to make them more something. Um, 
But it was to the level that was almost reminding me of like kind of like Evil Dead mm. movies, like just like super over the top. Like I watched, I felt like I was watching like a Raimi film. I don't know. It was just <laughs> a lot. Um, I don't know. What do you think of the gratuitous violence in Marvel? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't know if I guess we'll see if this becomes more of a thing in Marvel broadly, but it's uh, violence is so weird and the way we present it in American cinema is, is very strange yeah. because it's like we only clock it as violence when there's like gore involved and it's like mm-hmm. if it's just people beating the shit out of each other but there's no blood then it doesn't quote unquote feel violent I don't know it's weird I don't think I came with the uh, my dissertation on violence in American yeah, yeah. media for this podcast today um, but yeah I was uh, I was surprised by the kind of like the the goriness some of the body horror uh, mm-hmm. elements that that existed in Guardians 3 that was that was interesting I guess I haven't unpacked yet like what I think about this in terms of the larger context of Marvel but I definitely clocking it while I was watching that film was kind of like oh James Gunn's a little got to be a little off the leash with this that's what it felt like mm. to me is like uh, I don't know anyone who's who's kind of paying attention James Gunn the the director and, and writer of the Guardians trilogy is going over to you work for DC's film arm <gasps> now and he's going to be like basically like one of the two co-leads of their entire cinematic universe. Um, And so he's kind of breaking up with Marvel and this was his last hurrah. And I feel like, yeah, it kind of felt to me like a movie made by someone who maybe always wanted to take things in these directions, Mm. but was kind of like prevented from doing that through threat of like, if you want to keep working with the MCU, this is what you've got to do. And Mm -hmm. now he's kind of, well, uh, this is it. I'm done. So you can stop me or not. Um, yeah. So it did feel a little more adult in that sense. And yeah, it, it was surprising, but I didn't, I don't know. I didn't have a particularly negative reaction to it. It seemed mm-hmm. to fit with the tone of the movie overall. I think, you yeah. know, Guardians is a franchise that's quite funny and has really like poppy fun moments. But this one was a bit darker than the other two in the series and was definitely dealing with some pretty gnarly themes and narrative yeah. beats. And it felt like the, the violence, the gore, the body horror was all in support of that. It didn't feel gratuitous to just be shocking, I guess mm. is what I would say. Mm-hmm. It, it felt like it lined up for the most part with, with what we were being presented with in terms of the villain and and helping to understand why, our main villain was a uh, scary and uh like bad person. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think um overall um our personal feelings about <laughs> about the amount of violence aside, I think it had a satisfying conclusion to the character arcs. Like I think was one of the stronger like trilogy endings that Mm -hmm. I can recall in recent memory. Like I really feel like I walked away from that feeling like peaceful conclusion. Like I was pretty satisfied, even if some of the endings were sad, which I appreciated. Um, So yeah, good time. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think it was definitely the best Marvel movie that they've had in a minute. Yeah. Um, Which I haven't been completely down on the phase four stuff so far. I think it's tough to build so many films towards an arc like Thanos and Endgame. And what that all did was super impressive and kind of like Mm. catching lightning in a bottle Mm -hmm. and trying to reset and do this all over again is going to be bumpy and hard. So I, yeah, I don't know. I haven't completely hated the experimentation that's been happening in this phase, but it definitely hasn't been on the same level as what we were kind of getting leading up to end game. But this, yeah. this movie was definitely the best one that we've had in a minute. And I agree with everything you said about the guardians kind of being my, some of my favorite MCU characters and definitely being the strongest trilogy. I think we've had in, in the MCU uh, so far. And uh, yeah, I just like how uh, these stories more than I think a lot of the MCU films really do seem to be saying something about found family and, familial trauma is is a lot about family uh yeah in these stories and that resonates with me narratively and thematically so it's good stuff 
<laughs> One little thing I just remembered that I enjoyed in the movie um, is um, I'm pretty sure this is Dave Bautista who plays Drax in the Guardians. I'm pretty sure this is like his last role as Drax. Like he's yeah. out of his contract and stuff like that, which like good for him. I want to see him doing more varied stuff because I think he has a lot more talent than people sort of give him credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's Filipino. And I noticed that uh, there's this there's a scene in the movie where um, he has to sort of convince a bunch of alien children to like do something uh, for their safety, but they don't. None of them speak the same language because they're like a bunch of aliens that they found. <laughs> and I could pick up snippets of like as the children were talking. Um, there's this moment where Drax uh, nonchalantly is starts communicating with them. And um, part of their alien language was based on Tagalog, which is oh, wow. the language of the Philippines. And I was able to pick up some words here and there. And I just thought that was like a really cute little little thing that they did. Um, and there's this like there's this whole through line of how like um, the rest of the Guardians think Drax is stupid, and he says something to the effect of like um, like they were like oh, you speak their language? Like, why didn't you say anything? And he's like, well, you never asked. Um, yeah. But I just thought that 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 little Easter egg was really cute uh, and cool. So I just I just like that. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's very cool. I love that. So yeah, Guardians. Um, what? Are, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing all right. We have been on a little bit of a, a break uh, for a few weeks. So I'll just acknowledge we hadn't mentioned yet. Um, so if anyone's yeah. been keeping track, this episode is a little bit later than our usual gap. Um, and yeah, we're sorry to have to push things back a little bit, but there's just been some stuff going on personally that uh, yeah. has caused some caused some challenges. But we're we're here and we're back and we're happy to be back. So acknowledging thank you for your patience. Acknowledging that, yes, thank you for your patience um, while we had to be away. Um, but yeah, I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. I am definitely feeling the f- Legend of Zelda FOMO. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, Tears of the Kingdom came out on Friday, and I am vocally not someone who particularly <laughs> enjoyed Breath of the Wild, and yet I can't mm. in good conscience sit here and look at all these 10 out of 10s and this like yeah. fucking 97 or whatever on Open Critic and not be a little bit intrigued. Mm-hmm. And my partner downloaded and started playing it yesterday, and I'm struggling to keep my eyes on my own TV as I Whoa. watch him. <laughs> so what? I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna succumb or not. I'm oh, forcing shit. myself to wait a bit longer and let the let try to let the FOMO subside and see if it's uh if it's a real if i actually want to play it or if i just want to be a part of the moment <laughs> it's like elden ring all over again yeah it is it is it really is by all accounts of this game is huge and mm. there's so much stuff coming out that i'm just like if i just left this alone i would have time to play like eight other games mm. um but we'll see i don't know are you uh are you following the tears of the kingdom news at all I mean, similarly, I've just been seeing all the hype. Um, I saw Laura K. Buzz's accessibility Mm, review mm -hmm. and just sort of like general sentiments on the game also being very positive. And um, I'm just like seeing people playing it and all over social media. I'm even seeing like how great it is. Um, So I'm definitely like I'm seeing that. I don't. I don't know. I think similarly to you, I'm sort of like I played a I was very I was a very big um, Legend of Zelda fan like growing up. And um, I was just sort of frustrated with a lot of the mechanics in Breath of the Wild. Um, So just very similar to you, like um, I have sort of my reservations, but I Mm -hmm. am not immune to the (laughs) the pull of the current moment and how everyone and their mother is like so into this game. (laughs) So who knows? I think for me, a lot of it too is the, I mean, the price tag for my Nintendo games. Yeah. Really? Like a switch game and you want me to pay like $70? Like, I'm just like, uh, (laughs) but, um, I don't know. I I'm not not intrigued. Similarly, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. I I could see myself playing it. I just wanna I wanna know for sure that I'm gonna want to stick with it and enjoy it. 
So I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'll just watch some more streams and then make yeah, a decision. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. I'm kind of like, okay, I might get this. I might enjoy it for a weekend, but then how quickly am I going to bounce when the next thing that I really want to play comes out? <laughs> right. Um, is it going to be enough to keep me from picking up the next game or will it? Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, like so much of, of Legend of Zelda gameplay loops involve really complicated puzzle solving. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's not always like my jam. Yeah. Like I like adventure. I like role playing. I like open world. Mm-hmm. But when it moving forward requires entering some kind of temple and doing spending an hour or more just like moving blocks around or getting beams of light to line up in a certain way or pushing a button here and then remembering the path back to some door three levels ago that I need to <laughs> that is now open I'm just like oh my bra- my brain <laughs> uh, so yeah We'll That's see. my main we'll fear. See. I, I don't want to come on here and be a Legend of Zelda naysayer, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm torn at the moment. So. I'm traumatized by water temples. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Well, Spencer, the good news is that we're not here to talk about uh, Legend of Zelda today, Tears of the Kingdom oh. or otherwise. <laughs> uh, we're actually here to discuss a game that uh, we did play and that we do yes. have a lot of thoughts and feelings about. Which is hmm. called I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist. I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist. The amount of times <laughs> when people have been like, oh, what are you playing? And I'll say, I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, no, it's a the, fun that's title. That's the name of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I was a teenage exocolonist, or exocolonist for short, is a 2022 role playing video game developed by Northway Games and published by Finji that was released on the Switch, uh, PS4, PS5, and, um, and computer, PC, Mac, Linux, all that good stuff. Uh, from the game's description, it says, uh, spend your teenage years on an alien planet in this narrative RPG with card-based battles. Explore, grow up, and fall in love. The choices you make and skills you master over 10 years will determine the course of your life and the survival of your colony. Um, the player starts the game as a as a 10-year-old, as was just alluded in that description, and uh, you've just arrived with your, your family and a few hundred other humans on an alien planet, uh, and your group has abandoned Earth, uh, which we've destroyed, <laughs> spoiler mm-hmm. alert, and <laughs> gone out into space in search of a new home. Uh, so you are the titular exocolonist, and you play through each year of your main character's life, which is broken into 13 months per year. You get an extra month on this alien planet. Nice. And you go through events <laughs> that affect you, your friends, your family, uh, and the colony until the game ends when the char- main character turns 20. Uh, the game has received several award nominations, including Excellence in Narrative from the Independent Games Festival, as well as both Best Narrative and the Social Impact Award from Game Developers Choice Awards, and several other nominations. Um, Spencer, what did you think of I Was a Teenage Exocolonist? Um, well, let me just say I have like over 70 hours logged in this oh. game and counting. Oh, <laughs> 70. Wow. 70. Seven I... zero. <laughs> Seven zero. I love this game. <laughs> I love her. I I think this game is like super underrated. Like I am floored that it doesn't have more of a following. I guess I could sort of attribute it to it's a very like feminist queer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it literally has been self built. So self billing itself as the blue heron pronouns game. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Um, yes. It's like very just progressive and anti capitalist and sort of um it's like as if all of your favorite like sci fi feminist uh like Afrofuturist like writers if like what everything they've written about like came to pass which is like in the game uh you come to learn that the colony that you're a part of like we'll get more into like the mechanics and stuff Mm -hmm. in a minute but it's like um in one of my playthroughs 
which is another thing. It's like there's so much in the game. But like yeah. in one of my playthroughs in school, I learned that the whole the whole colony that I'm a part of came together because all of the people in the colony decided to take the writings of a popular sci-fi writer on Earth and sort of like take their principles and like build a society around it and then leave the planet. It's like very much that. So like for a lot of the things that I read and the, and the media I like, it just felt like someone built a world around that. And it's just like very cool. Um, but I also love how it doesn't super moralize itself. Mm, mm-hmm. Like the game is very aware of like, um, you know, it, it like, I think many of the colonists are anti-capitalists, but the game also leaves room for like, it doesn't force you to agree with that. Yeah. It doesn't force you to sort of like accept um, that what you're doing is right in terms of colonizing a new planet because humanity has extracted the resources and destroyed the planet that they come from. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pretend that like there's no violence being committed, but just by the effect of landing on a planet and deciding to live on it just because you as humans have the right to live just as much as anything else. Like it doesn't try to say that anything in that is right or wrong. Like I think it really does a great job of allowing you to make your own conclusions and Mm -hmm. also leave space for like sort of um, like through the lens of like being a teenager, like just sort of working through these ideas and figuring out for yourself the type of person you want to be. Cause there is discussion of like uh, of, of capitalism and is it, like inherently bad or is it just because the people who it's like been got it's been allowed to spin out of control um Mm -hmm. and excuse other atrocities like i don't know I, i just think like the way it manages to break down and make all of these different um societal influences and ways of being um, just sort of like digestible and really makes you reflect. I don't know. I'm just, I think it's great. I think it's, it's just really well done. Um, it's also just like got that nice mix of like mystery and, um, underlying like sexual tension (laughs) and, um, just like stuff around the planet you're in and, and what's going on with it. Um, like it's just, Oh, it's giving so much. Um, so I've I've played through like ten times at this point. Um, and I still haven't unlocked all of the endings and I'm yeah. still encountering new new things, new paths, completely different playthroughs each time. Mm-hmm. And I just really appreciate how much is going on in this game and the replay value is incredibly high. Um I've been playing it on the steam deck um so it's very portable nice um and i feel like it's just a nice way to it's been my kind of like winding down for the day game lately just because because it's the repetition of uh, like basically the the way it works is the game um it's a time loop so like your ship to get to this planet it passed through a wormhole Something about that. We don't need to <laughs> explain it too much. But you're a character every time they die, um, they're reborn. And they mm-hmm. at the moment, they're 10 years old and passing through this wormhole. And so you're able to kind of live a different life over and over and over again. Um, mm-hmm. So really cool, insane replay value, packed with thought-provoking narrative and characterization and philosophy, beautiful art, beautiful music. I don't know what what more I could ask for in a game, so I've been loving it. (laughs) Amazing. Wow. (laughs) That was glowing. (laughs) Uh, I think I'm with you on a lot of points, I think, as we work through this. I do have a few critiques about the game, but I think they're pretty minimal. Um, I agree with you that the the real strength of the game is the variability that you're referencing. Mm. So let's let's talk a little bit about kind of the the gameplay loop and, and what you're actually doing. And I was a teenage exocolonist, so... Uh, has a very, I think, traditional RPG opening in that mm-hmm. you don't, you're not, it's not a character creator in the, like a full character design uh, tool that they give you. Like you're not creating your character's face or anything like that, but they give you some really good, like, initial options to start. 
Uh, the game's very fluid in terms of presentation of gender and, mm. you know, the, you're the, you choose your own pronouns. It has a, a, a mechanism for you to enter your own pronoun. You know, it gives you the options of he, him, they, them, uh, or she, her, I think. And then mm-hmm. um, you, but, or you could type in your own gender pronouns your own pronouns and set them yourself. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility there and, and you can pick your, your gender presentation from one of three options. Um, but then that can be changed at any point during the game and it has no impact on your relationships with other folks. And it's not something that's like locked behind, uh, any sort of stat or anything. It's just something you can, you can do. So Mm -hmm. it really gives you that flexibility. You, you do get to pick your own name in the beginning of the game too. It gives you a few different options or you can put in something else. Um, and then you make a few key decisions about your, your character and like what their initial stats are going to be to start the game. And those manifest as, uh, I, I just think narratively they give really cool explanations for, what's triggering these stats. So you, you choose your most treasured possession because again, you're a Mm -hmm. 10 year old child at the very beginning of the game. So you're picking your favorite possession and what that means to you. And that has, you know, that translates into a stat boost. Um, You get to pick a key aspect of your personality via your augment. So in this world, um, all humans, most humans anyway, choose to have an augment. And that's like one kind of sci-fi E thing yeah. <laughs> that you have done to you. Um, I think one that I remember picking was like a sixth finger and that gives nice. you more like dexterity or it was something yeah. random like that, that like helps you with certain stat checks. Um, and you choose your childhood friend and that gives you like a, a relationship boost with that individual as well as translates to a, a stat boost as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual stats that you have that, that you know, they make numbers go up uh, are kind of broken down into three categories that are all color coded. I don't know if they ever actually name the categories, but they're represented by a little dialogue uh when like bubble, mm-hmm. which is kind of like there, those are things like bravery, empathy. They're like social uh, right. interaction stats. Um, there's ones that are more like logic and and brain based, and those are symbolized by a little brain. That's like reason and engineering and biology. Biology, yeah. Um, and then there's one that's uh, focused on physicality. It's represented by a little <laughs> bicep flexing bicep, and yeah. those are uh, like strength, st- bravery. Uh, well, I think bravery was in, bravery was up in yellow. That's in oh, the right. in the like social category. But it's yeah, it's um, combat toughness. I think mm-hmm. animals is weirdly mm-hmm. in that category. But it's like your your connection to the physical world, mm-hmm. basically. And so as you play through the game, you are every month you can move around the the main screen, and there might be opportunities to have dialogue with uh, the different people. There's like I don't know, maybe 10 or so characters that you can interact with within the colony. Mm-hmm. It's it's suggested that there's hundreds of humans living here, but they they restrict who you can actually interact with to just like a key number of people, which is primarily your parents and then the the other kids that are there. There's a handful of other kids and those are the folks who when you get a little older, you can eventually romance and develop relationships with. But so those are the folks you can interact with. So you can run around the map and interact with those folks. But then for each month, you have to pick an activity. And that activity will come with some small stat boost. Um, It will probably trigger a uh, they have these card battle mini games. So it is a deck building game. Uh, the cards signify different memories that you have. So early mm-hmm. on in the game, all of the cards correlate to things like first words, first <laughs> steps, like first thing I saw, like first time I got in trouble. And they're all not worth very many points. Um, and then as you advance in the game, you get memories that are worth more points. And the card game itself is pretty straightforward. It's kind of like building a poker hand. You're mm-hmm. trying to build like straights or flushes of the same color. And then you get points based on uh, how well you're able to create a straight or a flush, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's simple enough. It has enough complexity to keep it from being boring. But it's it's kept simple enough that it's never never super challenging like i feel like it's very flexible and actually the game even allows you to turn the card battle off entirely if you yeah. if you don't have to engage with the cards you could turn that off and just play this as text based narrative adventure game um so you're making these decisions for your character all the stat boosts all the relationship boosts everything is very uh minimal like 
if I choose to do an activity for a month, let's say I decide to actually go to school and I'm <laughs> going to go to what's basically like an art class and increase my creativity points, I'm probably only going to get one or two creativity points that month. And so then that is tracked over 13 months in a year and 10 years. You're making these decisions to do these things. It's one activity per month and then stretched out. And so that's how you eventually get up to, you know, the stats can go up to 100 for each thing. But it takes, you start with like just a few points in each stat category and it takes a long time to build relationships, to uh, get good at something Mm -hmm. uh, or to increase a particular stat. And so the game has all this variability built into it, but it's designed in a way that it really rewards you for investing in certain people and certain activities. If you try to just go around and do a little bit of everything, you'll probably never be good at enough things to significantly influence events in in the community Mm -hmm. um i want to take a minute to talk a bit about the design of the game because the i read a really interesting piece that was actually written by sarah northway who's one of the two main creators of the game northway games is actually it's a it's a it's a couple it's a partner um partnered couple and they uh make their games together and then they like hire contractors to help and stuff so it's two people and then Mm -hmm. they they like hire their folks to help out and she wrote this uh, this piece called Deep Dive, using ExoScript to tame the narrative octopus of I was a teenage exocolonist. Um, and in the piece, she's talking about like how they actually designed the game. Um, and she's like, she was the lead designer on exocolonist. Her and her partner kind of switch off with each game as to who's kind of the lead on it. And this one was, was hers. Um, in the piece, she talks about how the game is built with over 800 narrative events. Um, there really isn't voice acting in the game or anything, so everything plays out via text on the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and those 800 narrative events break down into four main categories. So it can be an event that's part of the main plot. That's something that's going to occur in every playthrough regardless of the choices that you make. Um, it might play out differently depending on the choices that you make, but the the event itself is going to occur regardless. Um, sequential threads. So those are story events that are triggered by repeated time spent in certain locations. So for one example, um, if I repeatedly went and worked at the farm, I eventually opened up a narrative where one of my friends was hiding a pet. And if I kept mm-hmm. going back and working at the farm, I could see the whole story over time, over years of like 10 sequential events that happened around this narrative thread of him hiding this alien species in the barn and raising it and where that yeah. goes. Um there's friendship events, which are triggered by developing friendships. So all of the the kids that you are friends with, they have, I think it's like, what is, is it, are they one to a hundred too? Are they yeah. on that same meter? Yeah. So you're yeah. raising, you're getting their little heart symbols, but you're raising relationship points with them and trying to max out those friendships. And as you hit certain milestones in achieving relationship points, that triggers events specific to that individual. Um, and then finally, there's exploration uh events or yeah exploration narrative events which are kind of like rpg encounters when you go out into the world outside of the base there's kind of just symbols across the map that you can interact with and you get a little narrative story kind of feels almost like oregon trail-esque yes (laughs) like this thing happens and you might have a little card game or a stat check or something like that and and there'll be an effect um so she's talking about like how they actually like built all of that and um, and how they wanted the game to be super replayable. And and I've got a quote from from Sarah Northway's piece here that, that I wanted to read because I think it's important about kind of understanding the, the complexity of this game, like what's going on under the hood. Um, mm-hmm. So she says, with our focus on replayability, I wanted players to only see a small amount of the narrative during each life, but without forcing them into one track at a time. For a dynamic open world, we'd need events to occur with or without you there to witness them. And you could pop in on a plot line in the middle of some crisis that might be too late to solve. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to see the world from different points of view as you grow up in the game, as a child or an adult, as a farmer or a soldier, as a romantic or a rebel. A branching narrative wasn't going to cut it, or at least not just one. We needed many different plot lines overlapping and affecting one another and hundreds of one-off triggered events to build a narrative world you could explore at will. And we couldn't always control what order events would fire in or what state the world would be in when they did. Our narrative wasn't a branching tree, but a, but a juggling octopus, flexible <laughs> and interconnected with a core narrative and many wriggling limbs. Um, and so I think that 
hopefully helps kind of explain how you know when Spencer's talking about playing this through this game like ten plus times. I think <laughs> I played through maybe three or four times. It, it mm-hmm. really is designed with this idea of replayability in mind that you're constantly experiencing a new path through the world, and it be, especially because it takes place from ages ten to twenty. It it really does a good job, I think, of simulating the feeling of growing up, of figuring yeah. out who you're going to be, of figuring out who you want to be friends with. Um, and, and I think that's the strength of the the game. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what uh, what other th- aspects of the game stuck out to you that no, you want to touch was, on? That was a very wonderfully said and comprehensive review of kind of like what's going on in this game. I think something that came to mind, uh, I love that quote you read um, from Sarah Northway. I remember um, like one of the things I liked about the sort of loop, the replayability is that like based on choices you make in one life in the next one, um, certain events become expedited so that you're not, you're not, mired in the tedium yeah. of like having to redo all of these steps to get to a certain conclusion mm-hmm. um like new dialogue options or new decisions will pop up in situations and they have like a little wormhole next to them that says like from a past life like you remember how to do x y and z so like you can fix this problem right away mm-hmm. um so i like the kind of like acknowledgement of the fact that you are in this in this loop and the way that you're able to kind of shortcut things um because like if you if you did just play one like you really can't experience the full extent of the game or even n- know all of the characters um well, or and meet it's, all of the characters are- I think to that, I don't think this is spoilering to say, but uh-huh. there there are events that happen in your first playthrough that are unavoidable on yeah, the first exactly. playthrough. Yeah. Um, there's some that are really tough to avoid, and there's some that are just straight up, you can't avoid it on the first yeah. playthrough um, because the game wants you to replay it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just like lots of death and <laughs> uh, tragic occurrences. Yeah, most, mostly um, bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, mostly bad stuff. So I don't know. I I found it um, very satisfying um, to explore and sort of puzzle out. Um, But it was interesting when you were reading that quote, because I remember I was lurking on the exocolonist subreddit Mm -hmm. um, and people were asking, like, you know, I'm trying to trigger this certain character meeting and I can't seem to get it. And it was funny just seeing people um, in the comments being like, well, here's how I did it. And someone else being like, well, I follow those exact steps. And like, that never happened for me. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. And someone else was like, I literally opened up the source code of this game. And the level of complexity involved in how events are triggered is like crazy. Um, So I just, the part where they were like, um, we couldn't always control what order events would fire in or what state the world would be in when they did was kind of interesting Mm -hmm. to me because it's like, even within the game, like depending on the outcome you desire, like people still haven't figured out the right sequence of events to trigger that thing. So it just feels even more like the game is just so expansive and, and there's so much that went into um, sort of making it, this very rich narrative tapestry where you could have a different experience each time. Like I'm just sort of floored by the, by the the level of effort that went into that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, in that piece that, that Sarah wrote, she actually has samples of the, like the actual coded script of the game to some of the, the exo script stuff. And she's talking like you can see some of the the way that they built the triggers it was reliant on multiple things so you might have an event that it doesn't just show up because you've gotten to x percentage of your relationship with this friend you also have to have a certain level of stress and you also Mm. have to be meeting um you know you have to be a certain level of rebelliousness the the game Mm. tracks whether or not you like go along with the things your parents and adults tell you or if you push back on things and that like so you have a rebellious stat too Mm -hmm. and if you're if you've demonstrated historically that you're a certain level of complacent or a certain level of like 
you know, you go along with what adults say and then something happens where you want to fight back, you might not be able to access that option because that's counter to the person that you've been to date. Um, I think one of the taglines for the game is the choices you make make you, which Mm. is like a sentence that I'm sure (laughs) that they did not come up with. I've heard that phrase from other places, but Mm. um, it really does describe the way this game thinks about like how you become the person that you are. Mm -hmm. Um, and and with but with that variability and this is not an issue that i have with the game but i think you could go into this game and walk out with a completely different uh this game reflects your own your own politics and your own values back at you it is i think it's a mirror in that sense mm-hmm. um if you if you're going in and you're making decisions based on on what you actually think and so if you come in and you play this game you could get a completely different quote unquote good ending where humanity survives and Mm -hmm. the world and the situation looks completely different than what I consider to be my quote unquote good endings Mm -hmm. based on my values. Yeah. Um, And the game will, to your point before, let you do that and not, not really judge you for it. Yeah. Um, Which I guess, yeah, I don't know then if that, takes away from the game's ability to say anything definitive about humanity. Or I find mm. myself questioning like what this game's perspective is, or, like what are the designers perspective on some of these things? Like they've created this setup and then they're letting you as the player really decide where you want to go from there. But I don't know necessarily what the developers think about mm. the idea of an exo colony, about the idea of humanity trying to abandon our planet, which we have driven into the ground through our own greed Mm -hmm. and mismanagement and try to set up on a new planet. And Mm -hmm. the characters in the game are by and large, like quite flawed. And there's a lot from our modern day, like society and culture that gets brought to the new colony, even as they're trying to restart in a lot of ways. And so, I don't know, I, I guess I found myself wondering what the developer's perspective on these things might be because the game does give you so many options with how do you go about things that you could walk away with a really different idea of what the future of humanity should look like and not maybe not actually learning any lessons uh, mm. from my perspective of, of yeah. what of what we've done to our current planet. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's like... <sighs> Oh man, it's just so much. I like you saying that. It's like triggering so much, so many different <laughs> lines of thought for me. Like, I think, um, yes, like on the one hand, there seems to be this very strong, like, um, environmentally conscious, anti colonialist mindset. And yet, by the function of, you your colony landing on this planet and starting to establish its will there and sort of like overtaking the existing flora and fauna and what Mm -hmm. was going on on that planet before it's like are we not just perpetuating what we left behind did we even have a right to leave what we left behind or Mm -hmm. should we have gone down um with the earth that we like like saw, saw through the situation that we created um there is a plot line that I eventually was able to accomplish where um, I was able to um, like make contact with the, with a presence that was on the planet before we arrived. Um, and where I also like got to the source of what was causing the time loops um, mm-hmm. and f- learned a bit more about the connection between the planet and the wormhole that, that you pass through that, that hangs out above it. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was a conversation with um, uh, one of these alien characters who, um, um, you know, has, has been studying humans, but was thousands of years old and comes from a very different perspective. And they were basically like talking about how, um, humans have this obsession with like deriving meaning from their lives, maybe because our lives are so short and that, um, we feel like there needs to be some purpose to everything we're doing or that humanity in general is destined to some kind of greatness that we're owed. Mm. And it kind of was just like, you know, I don't understand that. And 
I also kind of feel like, like I can't relate to that. Um, and so to me, I kind of feel like, like in terms of like, what, what were the developers thinking? Like, I think it just brings up this conversation of like, like, what is the meaning of life? Like, um, is there a meaning like, or is it just like the choices we make and the experiences we're able to have while we're able to have them? Like maybe humans are supposed to die eventually. Mm -hmm. Like maybe we should never have left the earth. Like even though we had these, these big aspirations um, and desire to do things differently, like it doesn't mean that we're owed that. Um, and maybe there's no escaping from the from the situation that we created for ourselves on our home planet. There's even an option where when you get to a certain level of proficiency, you can sort of over the course of a few lifetimes set up a situation where your ship never actually leaves Earth mm. and you live your life on Earth. Um, and the, and you don't get to have the same extent of playthrough as you do um, in the normal game. Like like it's just like a narr like a narrative explanation of what happens uh, when you are born on Earth and stay there. Um, and I feel like that's included because, like everything else, like the game isn't trying to say like, oh, colonizing this new planet is what we're supposed to do, or it's it's not even like um, this is the goal of the game. It's it feels more like a philosophical thought exercise mm -hmm. in like you know what it means to be human and just examining how maybe there is no <laughs> right answer i don't know that's yeah. kind of, that's kind yeah. of what i was getting from it <laughs> yeah I, I think as like a um just almost like a puzzle box or yeah. like i said earlier like a mirror for our own perspectives. The The game is super successful in that regard, or, or at least for it was for me. I really found mm -hmm. myself thinking about my own uh, beliefs and values when it comes to particularly, yeah. uh, I think, ish, uh, t themes of sustainability, stewardship of nature, living in mm. balance with nature. Um, I had I similarly went down uh, the path that you're describing uh, where you get to meet and talk to some an alien character, yeah, uh, alien characters that have been around for thousands of years, and um, in in a different moment of the game, got a slightly different speech that was a bit more aggressive. Um, where the the character uh, first first is telling us like your kind had the option to stay where they were, and you chose mm -hmm. to come here and continue to stay here when you could have just chosen to die. Like mm. that is a perspective that that a character has and, and brings forth. Um, and then in kind of another moment says says this bit, animals with their short lives are ignorant creatures. They care only for survival and for the survival of their children. They have no concept of a legacy that spans the lifetime of a planet. They cannot be blamed for living is their only purpose. But humans are animals with the power of gods. You consume recklessly, and your ceaseless fear of death fouls your every action. You shape the planet. You bend nature to your will, thinking only of yourselves. This is a power no animal should have. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I think the game and some of what I consider to be some of my quote-unquote good endings were ones where the humans were either severely limited in mm -hmm. what they the impact they could have on the planet or we didn't survive. Um, mm -hmm. it, the fact that the game gives you the option to explore that, or you could literally be someone who only does, there's like one of the monthly events that you can do that I think most folks probably do this when they just want to, you, you have a building stress level that occurs every month. And so if you continue to always go to class or always be engaging in activities, your stress will progressively build. And once it maxes out, you the game forces you to spend a month doing a relaxation activity but you could choose to only do the relaxation activities so True. i could choose to just spend all of my time hanging out in the lounge and fucking around and not doing anything and that's just yeah. as valid a way to play the game mm -hmm. um you won't get a game over it won't end anything things will play out differently but it's just as valid of a choice so you could just you could be apathetic 
and not contribute <laughs> and just hang out. And the game holds both of those things up as like, yeah, again, equally valid ways to approach it and to play out your story. And I think that's I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I do kind of keep coming back to <sighs> for all of the progressiveness that exists in the game. I think you could play through it and and come away with a really different takeaway of what was was valuable, depending on what you bring into it. Yeah. No, yeah. Sorry, just <laughs> just you saying that made me think about that that thing that I really appreciated about how it didn't try to moralize how you spent your time. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I mean, from from childhood, your parents say things like, you know, we ca- we formed this colony because we wanted to do something different. So, like, we're not going to tell you how to spend your time. Like, it's really up to you. Like, you can go to mm-hmm. school. You can. We also think that you know, practical experience doing other activities outside of school can be just as valuable to your to your learning. Um, there becomes this sort of, as you get older, there's this conversation of like, because we have such a small number of humans who have come here um, and we're so focused on survival, like people are too busy to do things like make art or music, or, you know, develop culture. Like, like we have recordings from earth that are like hundreds of years old from the songs and, and, and stories that they told, but like, who's doing that here? And like, what's the value? Like culture still has value. Like who's doing that? Like not everyone can be a soldier. Not everyone can be like a hunter. Like part of humanity Mm -hmm. is, is also the people who are Uh, making things of beauty and like giving us sources of pleasure. Um, Like one character, um, when you are able to get to a high enough level with them, um, actually works to construct a bar, like having a place where people can just come and like talk and share space and, and like um, build culture that way. Like, like, like write music. Mm -hmm. Like you have the opportunity to kind of like, practice an instrument and produce the first piece Mm -hmm. of like original music out of the new colony. And that, and it it just talks about how that's just as important as like protecting the colony walls. And it's like, like I really enjoyed that sort of meditation on like the meaning uh, of those things of how, um, how humanity is created. Um, And two, like when we were talking a bit about like the different philosophical puzzles and arguments that it was representing. Um, I just wanted to go back a bit to what you were talking about with the augments. Um, it's like a, mm-hmm. like Jamie was saying, it's like a special power or, um, or bodily edit um, that it talks about mm-hmm. how parents will like choose it for their child. Um, so that they're like born with it. Um, there's even a character who their parents didn't, tell them what augment or if they were given one. And that's kind of like a thing of like, you know, I get to figure out for myself, like who I want to be, or uh, I don't need to depend on an augment to like give me self-worth or things like that. Um, But there's Mm -hmm. also like, I really enjoyed, cause like you don't know what people's augments are from the jump. Like as you get to know them, they sort of like you figure it out or you, you learn about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, like, one character, um, at first, I, like, wasn't sure what to think of her because she was very rude and bossy and controlling. Um, And she would say things that, like, like, she would be like, you look terrible or, like, um, this person, uh, like, smells or something. And if you pushed back and you were like, Hey, like, like stop being mean. Um, her, your friendship with her would actually go up because she enjoyed that you were like pushing mm-hmm. back and had, had your own, uh, you know, leg to stand on and, and was, and weren't happy just taking her bullshit. Um, and as you got older, <laughs> like she becomes someone who's like very critical of, of the government and the way the colony is run. Mm-hmm. Um, and is someone who is very strongly advocating for for more culture to be brought into the colony um and is someone who is like you know just by like like dressing nice and caring about my appearance like i'm bringing a level of of beauty to the colony that isn't here uh, i'm not doing the best job of describing it but like i eventually learned that her that her no, argument you're, you're was good. that she's incapable of feeling shame and not mm-hmm. only did that explain like why she 
was comfortable voicing things that other people weren't or why she came off as rude or condescending. But it also explained like why she was such an influential person and a great leader because she like was mm-hmm. incapable of feeling like afraid or, or, or shamed into like changing her mind or going along with the flow or just like, you know, fading into the, into the background and, and holding up the status quo. Like it was just like so interesting. Or like, there's like another character who, whose augment was a complete lack of fear. And so like he Mm -hmm. was able to, um, you know, explore and like develop deep empathy for, um, the planet and the organisms who were already there and even was able to kind of like see beyond, um, you know, like, like Jamie was talking about the, the quote from one of the characters about how, um, our animalistic fear of death, this need to for survival causes us to commit horrible atrocities. For this character who had no fear, um, like he was able to just so much more clearly see the state of things and how like the way that that humans were acting was actually selfish and that he didn't even feel like mm-hmm. he belonged among humans. And like so just learning about these augments and thinking about like, you know, if humans lacked or had the addition of these certain things, like what are the possibilities for how we could be and how we could act and, and the levels beyond like, like the current things that we're still so stuck on, like homophobia, transphobia, racism, Mm -hmm. like we could be so much further ahead if we weren't so caught up in these same arguments that we've been having for hundreds of years. Like, it's Mm -hmm. just like, what could that look like? Like, I just really thought that kind of, imaginative like futurism was like really cool yeah yeah no i i agree with that and i want to talk a little bit more about um about characters and and writing because i I think those are some really really strong elements that the game has but something you were saying there triggered something for me which is the uh the world that the colonists live in like the colonists don't there there is no there's no homophobia mm-hmm. there's no transphobia there's no racism like a lot of gender and pretty much there's pretty much no gender or race-based bigotry that i saw in the world and in fact i'm kind of like scratching my head as whether there was bigotry generally i don't remember there being any it, is that correct am i misremembering I would say it's not quite bigotry but at a certain point um like more humans arrive who were very like from old earth and felt like yeah. um like they're much more like militarized and they kind of looked down Yeah, there on was you. there was a debate of yes, there was a debate of like militarism mm-hmm. versus um like yeah. pacifism. That definitely existed, but there weren't uh like more of the I guess, you know, what we know in our daily lives as being like the the vast array of yeah, social identity right. based bigotries doesn't really exist within the game. Um, it doesn't exist for these characters, which I didn't. I My issue is not with that as a concept for like a futurist mm-hmm. story, but I don't know how much you caught this when they talk about the backstory of the colonists and where they came from. I was a little I don't know. It just gave me complex feelings. The The part of the reason the colonists are able to start from this kind of societal blank slate is that the, those writings that they take on from, from the the sci-fi writer and stuff and the beliefs of the group that launches this project, uh, they actually make the intentional decision to like culturally castrate themselves almost like everyone gives up their own individual culture to become a part of this project mm-hmm. and to be launched into space. And there's also an element of um, like, they're not like humans aren't coupling with each other. Like if you want to have a kid, you're getting an mm-hmm. embryo from like a pre-selected pack. So there's like a yeah. eugenics like, yeah. factor going on here. And there was something, uh, I don't know. I, it's just the backstory for the colonists. It's like this one small element in the game and not something that I think, like didn't ruin the game for me by any means. But I really was thinking about this idea of like, if humanity could remove ourselves from our history and our culture and start over again, would that fix quote unquote fix all of these societal Mm -hmm, ills mm -hmm. in that way that the, 
the developers of the game that the you know it does seem to be a core i mean that's not a decision based thing that is they are saying like oh if we cut off all of this stuff and start it over again that we would we would have a society that doesn't have any of this identity based bigotry in it and i don't know that i agree that that's i, I think there are just because in our current society, there's a huge argument that like, oh, if we stop talking about history, if we stop focusing on the difference between everyone, if we create this more homogenized future, then we won't have these mm-hmm. problems. And I don't think that's actually right. true. And I don't think that's how we get to a better place yeah. societally. So for that to be kind of this core thesis statement of the the group that set these exocolonists off into yeah. space. Um, I don't know. I felt a kind of way. No, about I it. absolutely <laughs> did too. Like, like you said, it's like everyone gave up their individual cultures, the, the colony form, they developed a new language that they all speak. Um, mm-hmm. They went through the process of like mixing, like you said, like, like, parents were sort of paired based on like how they could most like mix backgrounds and, and stuff. Um, and I guess for me, like, I don't know that, that I guess, I guess it's true that, that after that you're in this colony and there is no sort of like racism or homophobia or transphobia. And and a lot of that social stuff is sort of like, of apparently not in the mix. I don't know that the game is trying to say though that that is ultimately a solve. Like I I feel like the game is saying that um you know there is no perfect society that's possible without us fundamentally changing how we relate to each other because like there are still very much like I don't think I don't think the game because you're from the perspective of a child and the adults in the game very much block you from from like <laughs> the reality of of the conversations and the history that they that they left behind when they came to this new planet. I feel like maybe that's that's a bit of a of a avoidance technique on behalf of the game to really talk mm. about that. Like I think from a child's perspective, you're just blocked out of those conversations. And so you don't know for sure, but I feel like it sows in you as a kid, this sort of doubt about like, is, was that really the right choice? Um, Cause I remember in a scene where you're in school learning about that history, you have the option to be like, Oh, well, isn't this, isn't this just another cult? Yeah. Like, isn't this like a cult that you're that you yeah, basically yeah. created? Like, this doesn't seem right. Or you can be like, oh, cool, like that's great. Or you can be like, ew, I hate it. Like, I wish we were back on Earth. Like, like it sort of leaves room for you to critique that for yourself, even if you're unable to talk that's about true. it with the adults in question. Um, and because there's still violence between people, because there's still mm-hmm. like you eventually learn that the colony that you're that. The, your parents and all these adults are part of before they left earth were like under attack and treated like fugitives and seen as like um traitors to humanity or whatever um like i think a lot mm-hmm. of that is fueled by you know they were people trying to do things differently in a capitalist and hegem- hegemonic like world but also it's like their solution wasn't perfect either like they were trying something yeah, but yeah. it's still far from whatever utopia we want to imagine. And and maybe that utopia is a fantasy. Like maybe there is no perfect yeah. society. Like I, I do feel like it was still raising those questions. And I absolutely agree that that hearing that was troubling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I agree with everything you're saying. And I, uh, yeah, it was just like, Oh God, like even where this group comes from and how we yeah. end up here is there's problems in this and yeah i don't i don't think that the game or like is trying to co-sign mm-hmm. any of that um but it just yeah it just raises a lot of really interesting questions and things to to yeah. consider i just found myself super thoughtful while i was playing this game and at the same time super like yeah. horny and stuff there's a lot of hot <laughs> hot people in this game <laughs> um no but i like the game definitely has a 
uh, you know, we kind of alluded to the fact that you can romance characters in the game. It's super, uh, just the the depth mm-hmm. and variety of relationships that you can build in the game I thought was super cool. Um, both platonic and romantic relationships. Uh, there's opportunities to uh, even be polyamorous. Mm-hmm. There's certain throuples that you can get in the game. And some of that's it's like, it's not just completely open ended. It's a little predefined. I mean, if you're particularly if you're going to be in a throuple, like you could date multiple people at the same time, but um, some characters won't be okay with that continuing past mm-hmm. a certain point. Um, they'll want you to be exclusive with them, or some characters will be cool with with you dating other people, but they they want to be in a relationship with you and somebody else mm-hmm. too. Um, I don't know. Just all of that was was very very cool and yeah. nuanced, and and the relationships felt really really well fleshed out all the characters feel super well defined at least the ones the ones that you can interact with and build relationships with and they're just really well well written and well realized they're all imperfect in their own ways they there's flaw you know they're flawed um but especially the one like getting to grow up with them just felt it was it was super immersive like i really felt like i knew these folks and there were Moments where childhood friendships mm-hmm. crack because certain traumatic events happen in the colony or, or people just grow apart or grow differently or their kind of innate beliefs and, and political perspectives come at odds yeah. as they get older and they start to go in different directions. And that like it felt sad sometimes to be like, oh, I, I can't really be friends with this person anymore because they've really gone off in a mm-hmm. different direction and I still care about them, but I don't really want to hang out with them or like invest a lot of time in them anymore. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did you have did you have favorite <laughs> characters? What did you think? Who did you romance? Tell me yeah, all the details. I mean, I feel like at first um, I romanced Dis. Uh, he was someone mm-hmm. who. Yep. Yeah, got like, me too. <laughs> just wanted to be outside the colony and uh, was very emo and like would listen to a lot of old earth yeah. music. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> you were me as a teen. Yeah. Um, I also romanced Tangent, who was his twin sister <laughs> at a different mm-hmm. playthroughs, um, just because I think um, like with uh, there were just some identity things I really related to her on um, and just like her sort of like personality. Like I wanted to get closer to her and like crack her tough outer shell. Um, I really loved Rex, who is this really yeah. hot yeah. guy with dog ears. <laughs> with dog ears? <laughs> and a very dog-like personality, yeah. just like really mm-hmm. fun and um, very giving and um who else? Oh, I mean, symbiosis uh, <laughs> got with him too. <laughs> wow. I got with Cal. <laughs> Very, uh... <laughs> I like, there I love was like it. no love one I you. didn't want to be with. I, it's interesting. I, I romance Cal on my first playthrough, and then in, in subsequent ones, I sort of. As different possibilities became apparent, uh, I sort of changed my mind on that um, and went in other directions. But I've been with people, I've been with aliens, I've been with animal people, I've been with all sorts, um, different monogamous, some runs, polyamorous, other runs. Like, I just, there was, I mean, I feel like typically I... And drawn to like one or two specific characters in this kind of setup, like a sort of dating sim or like life sim kind Mm -hmm. of deal. And I just think it's a testament to the rich character development and the awesome narrative and and also beautiful artwork um, in this game that I was just really like, I could get with any of y'all and be happy, honestly. (laughs) Um, yeah, <laughs> not to get too specific and spoilery, but yeah, like pretty much everyone has something about them that there is to love at one point or another. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I did uh, ten. I well, I did way fewer player playthroughs than you uh, for one thing, but I kind of like. I think I've only. I fooled around with Rex, but mm-hmm. pretty much only have dated uh, Dis in my playthroughs. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I think his narrative also goes much more in the direction of what I consider to be like, I, I don't know, what I feel is like definitively the way I want the game to play out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was a big part of it, too. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, 
I, every everybody in the game is hot and everybody yeah. has uh, like strong personalities that are worth engaging with. And I really appreciated the friendships. And I kind of love that the um, I don't know, just even when you max out a friendship, the scenes that that triggers with those folks uh, are really mm-hmm. special um, yeah. and meaningful. And it just the way it's able to simulate the feeling of actually growing up with a group of people and how you all change over time and stuff was, it was really, it was really cool. I've never played a game quite like that before. Yeah. Um, we've, we've been very glowing on this game and I think, I think we both liked it a lot, but I definitely have a couple small like issues with it. Did you, did you have any complaints about the game or anything that you, that wasn't your favorite? I mean, for all of my, joy in the kind of like expansiveness and the you know relationship and identity inclusion and the kind of like possibilities there um i did feel and again i feel like this is just due to how little there is out there even now that is Mm. that is able to tell stories outside of the i don't know the heteronormative mainstream that Mm -hmm. we're allowed to have as gamers um, that makes this stand out more. Um, But like, even though there were polyamorous options, even though there were trans characters um, who had very rich stories, like some of the most well-developed queer and trans characters that I've certainly experienced in gaming so far, um, there was still just a bit of like tokenization that I felt like was happening, um, which Again, like, I don't know if it just feels that way because there's so few out there. Mm. Like, we had a very, like, um, anime and manga-obsessed, like, adorable, like, uwu, like, uh, non-binary character (laughs) who was just, like, all over the place and, um, like, couldn't, you can't keep them in one place and they're they just don't know what they want to be and yeah yeah they don't know what they want to be yeah and, and just like the innocence like i feel like something that is talked about a lot with, within the trans community is how like in order to be acceptable like especially non-binary people are like defanged mm-hmm. like we're made to be like small beans who just want to <laughs> like hold hands and drink tea and we're like completely non-threatening and we're like small small humans and it's just like so Mm. annoying sometimes um to be like typecast in this way um like a lot of people like there's just this especially in like social media i think it's perpetuated like of non-binary people as like asexual adorable childlike Mm -hmm. innocent naive um and so there were like two non-binary characters and one of them was on that side of the trope spectrum and the other one was this very haughty like um uh disdainful like annoyed and above it all like kind of um bespeckled like non-binary librarian type basically Mm -hmm. um and it just felt kind of like just these like queer tropes of like what a masculine non-binary person is like versus a quote-unquote feminine non-binary person and it Mm -hmm. just felt very tropey like i've seen Mm. these characters a thousand times through like what straight people think non-binary people are like on various ends of like where they lean and i i just kind of just wanted something in addition to that i mean i guess i was the third non-binary character (laughs) in the game and (laughs) um (laughs) so i brought some of that myself but i just kind of wanted a little bit more um and again like and that's not a huge complaint. It was just something that I kind of rolled my eyes at a little bit. Yeah. But I also I mean, get I think that for, it's valid. For characters <laughs> that are supposedly like fully liberated from yeah. our current concepts of race and gender, it, yeah, it felt a little checking some, yeah, some yeah. familiar buckets being used. Yeah. 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 And then on the other hand, the the one main polyamorous character was like someone who was half dressed at all times, had casual sex with everybody in the colony, was someone who um couldn't relate or fathom like being in a 
monogamous committed relationship um, and just was very much like, um, you know, I do strictly casual. I'm like solo poly. Like I have sex constantly and everybody is obsessed with me kind of thing. And it's Mm -hmm. like, there are definitely (laughs) polyamorous people who are like that and we love them. And at the same time, I just think like, not that any game needs to be like solely an educational resource, but I, I, I feel like for people who are familiar with Polly, like meeting this character in the game was like very refreshing because it was very like sex positive, very like intimacy positive, wasn't trying to introduce a hierarchy in relationships and wasn't moralizing mm, being mm-hmm. polyamorous or monogamous. So I, I do think it was really great representation. At the same time, I feel like it completely would feed into what someone who has had no experience ever with polyamory, like what they think a polyamorous person is like. Yeah, And so like, and the game doesn't do much to be like, here's why I here's why I'm poly or why I believe relationships would be like this. Like, they're just like, this is how I am. Take it or leave it. Which Mm -hmm. again, I think I appreciate, Yeah, but I just think like for someone who's probably like, I can't think of another like more mainstream game where polyamory, healthy polyamory is an option or it's just sort of treated like, you know, like the thing where, um, like a mainstream game will let you be gay, but the characters just treat you the same way as if you were straight. Like it, like if, if you've never experienced what a realistic polyamorous relationship is like, I think this would give you a very skewed idea of what that could be. So I maybe would have appreciated a bit more, even outside of interactions with that character, just like understanding a bit more of the lifestyle would have been good. Um, So again, I just felt like a little tropey, and really was speaking to an already queer audience and not necessarily um, making a, a way for connection to people who are not familiar with that. So again, not sure whether to call that, to complain about that or just sort of, yeah. it was a thing. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe more of observation and like personal reaction. Yeah, it's it's tough when there's so few examples. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, because no... No one game or story or piece of media is ever going to hold all of all representation in it, and it's just hard. Yeah. And we have such limited ones. Yeah. So, you know, that was a thing. That being said, like, I don't think it really detracted anything mm-hmm. from my enjoyment of the game. It was just one of those things where I was like, couldn't one of these other characters who have a really compelling storyline and like their personalities are a bit more nuanced. Like, couldn't they just be using they, them pronouns? Like, <laughs> like yeah. it almost felt like because these characters use they, them pronouns, therefore they have this exaggerated personality trait mm-hmm. that happens to fall in line with a lot of uh, tropes about these types of people. Like it just felt a little on the nose. Yeah, it was <laughs> It was odd to me, again, with that framing of like, we've completely, re- you know, hit the reset button on human culture and and let go of all of these negative aspects of society that, yeah, there's only one like character that you consistently interact with in romance. Like you said, there's two non-binary characters identified in the game, um, mm-hmm. but only one of them is someone that you actually like grow up with and is like a character that you really form a relationship with mm-hmm. out of all the other characters in the game that you actually form relationships with. It's there's just one that's non-binary. That seems odd for yeah. a society that has supposedly has this more, uh, I don't know, elevated or expansive view of these things that, that that would be it. It's yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I I think that's, I think that's fair. Um, Oh, sorry. Was there more you want to say? No, I think, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's all. Um, (laughs) You go. (laughs) What's your complaints? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Well, I, yeah, I don't disagree with anything you just shared there. And then I think the only other thing that I would add is uh, as much as we've lauded the game for the variability and and the replayability is I is definitely a strength of the game. I think it's also a bit of a weakness that Mm -hmm. the game expects you to replay it because it's, it's long. I mean, you it's said long. you said you put you've put like seventy hours into this thing. Yeah. I think I'm probably in like the neighborhood of forty um, with my like three or four playthroughs. But man, one playthrough was like 
I want to say like 15 hours. And the mm. second time, I, or it might have even been closer to 20 for my very first playthrough. Mm. Now, repeated playthroughs do go faster yeah. because you can move through uh, some of the static elements more quickly. And they do make an effort to allow you to streamline things that would be more complex, like certain events that occur that have a whole complicated process that you would have to prevent that event from happening or change the outcome of that event. The second time you encounter that, you can kind of shortcut it and just be mm -hmm. like, I remember uh, from my past life how this is supposed to go and mm -hmm. here's what we can do to get around this quickly. That all is appreciated and certainly makes the game more replayable than it would be otherwise. But it's still, when you consider that there are, if you really want to see everything this game has to offer, all 800 events, all, I think there's 30 potential endings. And each of those endings, the 30 endings are just the 30 different ways your care, like the 30 different futures for your specific character. That all mm -hmm. gets colored in with the futures that you've created for all the other characters in the game and their relationship to you and the, their backstory. And that's all, that's all varied as well. So there's so many different ways the actual like ending screens can play out in the futures of all totally. these characters. If you really want to try to see all of that, it's it's a huge investment and it is arduous to I felt to keep going back and trying to replay mm -hmm. all 10 years of your life. Uh, 10 years is it's a long time. And yeah. so I I'm a little torn on whether or not I think this game could have been better served by leaning into the idea of like, you have this one life to live. Um, mm. But I appreciate the replayability elements that they built into it because there certainly are people who will want to replay it and that does make it more replayable. But I kind of feel like selling replayability as a core tenet of the game mm. is a little tough to swallow mm. um, because it's, it's, it's a kind of a long game to expect people to be doing many runs of, I think. So I, I don't know. I feel yeah. torn on that. I, it's not enough to like ruin the game or anything for me. And these, yeah, we're really yeah. talking quibbles at this point, but I did feel a little like I got to the end of it and I was excited to jump back in. But then by the time I finished the second playthrough, I was like, I mean, I'd love to see <laughs> more, but I yeah. just cannot. <laughs> yeah. Like I, yeah, I do feel like it's sort of like a long game disguised as a sh quick short game and so like it's really designed for people who like long form rpgs and want to invest like 40 to 70 plus hours and it's not a game for someone who's like oh a cool life sim i can play in under 20 hours like it's like not that even though on the surface it mm -hmm. seems like it is that <laughs> yeah yeah I, I just wonder like if you did just go into it and be like this is it this is my one life to live and we're gonna see what happens like you know if i was the kind of person who could just walk away at the end of that and not feel mm -hmm. like i needed to get my quote-unquote perfect ending it you know i don't know if that would change my my perspective on it but um yeah for a game that that really wants replayability to be a key part of it 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 feels a little a little long to be making totally. that, that pitch um and maybe if they had shortened it just a bit it, it it would be a little easier to say like yeah you're supposed to play this like a dozen times mm -hmm. um but but overall uh I really like this game. I think it's it's really special. I think it's one I'll be thinking about for a long time. And I'm not sure I'm completely done with it. Like, I definitely, I've taken a break from it um, for a few weeks now, but I could definitely see myself coming back at some point down the road and doing another playthrough and trying to really shake things things up. Um, what about you? Uh, what's kind of your, your final impressions of this game? Do you recommend people check it out? Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, like, it's both a strength and a weakness, the replayability. Like, I do think one of the great things about it is that, like, I mean, like you said, there's, like, over 800 narrative events. There's 30 endings. And then there's, like, there's the career ending. I think there's, like, 26 career endings. Mm -hmm. And then there's, like, six or eight, like, special endings that are triggered by following down certain narrative path lines. Yep. Um, and, like, and then within those endings... Even, like, the conclusion, like, the story sort of 
summarizes what happens in the years after your 20th birthday through to old age, if you are in an ending where you do live to old age, yeah. um, and sort of what happens to the people that you were closest to and, and the events that you triggered. And so, like, there's, like, probably hundreds, dozens and dozens of outcomes that you could experience. So, like, I do feel like this is a game that you could come back to months, years later and still have a completely new experience with it. And so, like, I think in terms of, I mean, value uh, <laughs> for your money and time, yeah. um, it's absolutely a return. I think um, just from, you know, what it's able to inspire or get you thinking about, um, it's great and then just in terms of the gameplay like it continues to feel fun and fresh even if it's like your 10th plus playthrough so like mm-hmm. i absolutely recommend it um i think that it's a game that i i very rarely like want to come back and replay games um so the fact that i've replayed it this many times yeah. and still i'm not bored with it like is definitely impactful to me um and i do think it's one that i could come back to in years and still get something new out of it so um yeah i i really love it <laughs> well there you have it folks go check out i was a teenage exo colonist don't sleep on that one Mm-mm. great game that we missed in 2022 but we're yeah. catching up now <laughs> <laughs> all right uh time is up for today's session of pixel therapy but thank you for tuning in and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own if you want more pixel therapy come check us out at patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just two dollars a month plus get opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly you're not up for contributing monetarily, but you enjoyed this episode. You can show your support for free by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and following us on Twitter and Instagram at Pixel Therapy Pod. That stuff is just as important and we appreciate it just as much. And you can keep up with all of this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Um, This week, I wanted to plug the rescue um, where we adopted our sweet um, and unfortunately um, past doggy, um, Odie. He um, passed away from some complications um, a couple weeks ago, and and while his time with us was cut short, um, he he brought so much to our family and we're, and we're forever grateful for, um, the shelter from which we adopted him and everything that they do for dogs. Um, and, and maybe I'll talk more about this in the future, but I did just want to mention, um, that has happened, um, in my life. And so the organization where we adopted our doggy, um, is called safe with us animal rescue. Um, they are based in Massachusetts. Um, but they, work with dogs like all up and down the eastern coast um, helping to rehome them Um, they welcome breeds that lots of people may discount or not not care about because of their perception as like violent or unmanageable Um, and they kind of really see the the love to give in every dog and work with every dog regardless of their of their past or or their trauma Um, and yeah, they're all volunteer. They are shelterless. So they work to place dogs in foster homes. Any dog that they come across has a network of fosters, um, of which we are recently a part, just in case there is a dog that needs a, a, a foster family. Um, we volunteered to kind of like be a safe place if that's ever needed. Um, so I just think they're great. Um, I think they really care about each individual dog. Um, and I would love if you wanted to don't if you had a couple dollars to throw their way um so that's safe with us animal rescue um and they can be found at safe with us animal rescue.org thank you for that side quest spencer and of course you know so sorry for for your recent loss it's a very very big bummer odin was a special guy yeah um That is our show for today, everyone. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC or pet a damn dog every now Mm -hmm. and then. We'll be back (laughs) soon with some more Pixel Pixel Therapy. therapy. Bye-bye.